going to start in Acts 18. There's three chapters in the book of Acts that deal with the, the activities around the, the origins of this church in Ephesus. And that's where we're going to look predominantly. Uh, the, the big picture piece is that the, the story of the Ephesian church is about spiritual growth and the expanding influence of the gospel, the Jesus story. Uh, it involves many people. Do you happen to know who wrote the book of Ephesians? Paul. It's not a trick question. So a lot of times we think Paul was the only player in the story there, but that's really not true. There are lots of people involved who invested themselves in the emergence of a church in that city. And in both the people that are serving to let those, that happen and the people receiving the message, it's very clear there are layers of learning. It's not a one and done thing. It's also apparent that it's not nearly as much about mystery as it is intent. See, if you don't intend something to happen, it's highly improbable that you'll ever experience it. If you don't in, have the intent of having a garden in your yard this summer, it's probably not going to happen. Even if you're a person of prayer and faith, if you sit on the sofa and look through the window and say, God, it would be wonderful if I had a garden. I would honor you with the first fruits of my garden. I would like tomatoes and green beans and squash. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> if all you do is sit on the sofa and pray, it is highly improbable you're going to have a garden. Agreed? To have a real garden, you're probably going to have to go out there and actually like break ground. You'll need a plow or a rototiller or a disc or something. You're going to have to turn the soil. And then you're going to have to actually plant seeds and pull weeds and spray bugs. Then you're going to have to go out and actually pick the produce. There's some effort involved if you want the garden. Now, you may get the garden and say, you know, it was God blessed my garden. I got a miraculous harvest from my garden. But your intent is reflected in the garden or its absence. The same is true in your spiritual life. And the church in Ephesus didn't just happen. We're going to read in a minute that the whole region became aware of Jesus. But that wasn't just an accident. It wasn't a mystery. It was because somebody intended it. If you intend for Jesus to be an important part of your life and your home and your children and their future, there are behaviors attached to that. Without the behaviors, it is highly improbable that will ever happen. It's much less about mystery and far more about intent. Now, let's start in Acts 18. It says, they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. And he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he said, I'll come back if it's God's will. And he set sail. He left Ephesus. Now, this is our introduction to the city of Ephesus. Paul had a strategic plan. As he began to take the Jesus story around the Mediterranean, the Roman world, he would choose centers of commerce and activity, important cities in regions. And he would go specifically to those places to establish a church or the Jesus story, knowing that it would radiate from there to the surrounding area. And he's arrived in Ephesus that same way. He's there for a brief time. Jesus was an observant Jewish man. He was the fulfillment of the Hebrew, what the Hebrew prophets had promised, the coming of a Messiah. So when Paul goes into a non-Jewish city to tell the Jesus story, he very logically goes to the place where it's most likely to be accepted first. That's the synagogue, the collection of the Jewish people. And he tells them about the Messiah. And he supports his story with the Hebrew scriptures. And in city after city after city, the first converts to Christianity... The first ones to embrace Jesus come from the Jewish community. Not exclusively so, and that's his pattern here, pattern here in Ephesus. And then he leaves two of, two of his traveling companions, Priscilla and Aquila, to stay in the city. They are going to put down roots. They're going to stay there for more than two years caring for this emerging group of believers. It's not a casual thing at all. Now in Acts, same chapter, 18, verse 24, they're going to get some more help. It says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. I love that sentence. We're introduced to a guy by the name of Apollos, and we're told he's Jewish. That's odd. Apollos is not a Jewish name. It's a Greek name. For an observant Jewish man to even have dinner in a non-Jewish home was wrong. And this guy's been assimilated enough into the culture, he's taken a Greek name. A Jew by the name of Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Alexandria is an Egyptian city. 
So we have a, a, a Jewish man from Egypt that has come to Ephesus, Asia Minor, Turkey, to tell the story of Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. <laughs> this isn't casual, folks. This is purposeful. We get way heated up with ourselves. We think that globalization and a global economy is a 21st century idea. Well, there's been international activity on behalf of the kingdom of God since we started. Now look at 25, verse 25. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. Though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more fully. So Apollos is there, and he's, he's awakening the people to the story of Jesus, and he himself is learning about the story of Jesus. You know, you do both at the same time. We don't tell the Jesus story because we've got it all figured out, or we have all the answers, or we never make a mistake. While we are serving him, we learn about him. It's the same is true for you and me. The same is true for you and me. Now, Apollos moves on, and Paul is going to return to Ephesus. Look at chapter 19 in verse 1. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul's been to Corinth, now Apollos has gone there. Paul took the road through the interior, and he arrived at Ephesus. And he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul turned the page. <laughs> then what baptism did you receive? Well, John's baptism. And Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And he told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Now this, this story in Ephesus is beginning to take some shape. And we see many people have been invested in the emerging church there. Paul has, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and a wife. Apollos has. You're going to meet in just a moment Alexander and Gaius and Aristarchus. They're going to have quite a significant investment in the church there. There's many people laboring in this field. And Luke in this chapter 19 continues an idea that is a theme for the book of Acts. Luke is the author of the book of Acts. He wrote two books in your New Testament. The book of Acts and which other book? Luke, you're so clever. <laughs> Luke tells the story of Jesus. The book of Acts tells the story of Jesus' friends after Jesus went back to heaven. And one of the themes in Luke's story, remember Luke wrote the book to help you and I become faithful followers of Jesus. He's telling the story on purpose. It's not just a random collection of facts. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus says to his disciples, he gives them a commandment, a commandment not to leave Jerusalem until they've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now that always seemed a bit odd to me. In John chapter 20, it's not in your notes, but in John's gospel, chapter 20, it says on the evening of the day of the resurrection, resurrection day in the evening, Jesus stepped into the room where the disciples were hiding. They were hiding because they were afraid. And he showed them the signs of his passion, the nail prints in his hands and the wound in his side. They'd seen him die on a cross. They knew he'd been buried in a tomb, and now he's standing in the room with them. What do you think the atmosphere was? Maybe a little electric? And it says that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The language is very, very similar to the creation narrative when at the very pinnacle of creation, we read that God fashioned a man from the dust of the earth and breathed in him and he became a living being. It's what separates us from all the rest of creation. We're created in the image of God. God's spirit indwells us. It's eternal. Our earth suits wear out. And that imagery is being duplicated in John 20 when Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. I would submit to you it is the new birth. They are born again. Every believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. We kind of shrug our shoulders and go, yeah, okay, can you move on? But, but that's pretty dramatic stuff. 
Paul writes to the churches, and he says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And the answer is no, they probably didn't know that. Because they're used to going to the temple because they thought God's, the temple was God's house. Even the Jewish people had a temple in the middle of the nation. Well, if in John 20, Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit and they're born again. About 40 days later is Acts chapter 1 when he commanded the disciples not to leave Jerusalem until they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm thinking that group of people, of all the people in the history of humanity, had the best training to be Jesus' representatives. They spent three years with Jesus. He taught them. They listened to him in public. They got to ask questions in private. They were in the boat when he walked on the water. Peter got out of the boat and walked with him. Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was chatted up by Moses and Elijah. They were in the cemetery at Bethany when Jesus asked the tomb to be opened, and he said, Lazarus, come here, and Lazarus walked out. They watched him speak to wind and waves. They saw him deliver men possessed by legions of demons. They saw him die on a cross. They stood with him when he was alive again. I'm thinking they're pretty well trained up. And Jesus commands them, don't even start your ministry until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's Luke 1. Luke chapter 2 is Pentecost. It's a Jewish holiday, 50 days after Passover. And on that holiday, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the believers in Jerusalem, and 3,000 people accept Jesus and are baptized that day. Acts chapter 10, the events that happened in Acts chapter 2 are duplicated, but this time not in Jerusalem, in Caesarea. Caesarea is an is, is Israeli town, but it's a pagan town. It's a Roman town. At the center of Caesarea is a temple to a Roman god. And on that particular day, it wasn't in a community of Jewish believers. It was in the home of a Roman centurion, a soldier. And the events of Acts chapter 2 are duplicated. Still within the boundaries of Israel, but now we get to Acts 19, and we're no longer in Israel. We're in Turkey, Asia Minor. We're in Ephesus. And the events of Acts 1 and Acts 10 are duplicated this time in a Gentile city, a pagan city. The Holy Spirit is poured out. Luke is inviting us as readers and as disciples towards some awareness. The transforming power of the, the Spirit of God and the significance of spirit baptism in our lives. We don't stop growing. We maintain a hungering and a thirsting for the things of God. See, there's an attitude that's crept into American Christendom, and, and I very much would like to disrupt it. It's an attitude of complacency and self-certainty and smugness that we've said the prayer and we've been dipped in the pool, and all of our God business is for the most part done. You don't get that idea from the Bible. I don't want you to live afraid of your salvation or live in fear of failing God. I want you to live with the awareness that you have to keep growing in your faith. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. Now watch what happens. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Even handkerchief and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of a Jewish chief priest tried this. And one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but you're not in my contact list. <laughs> And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And just for the record, that is a bad day of ministry. <laughs> all right? If you go forth in the name of Jesus and you encounter an unclean spirit and the outcome is you're beaten bloody and stripped naked and run through the street that way, that's a bad, that's not the target. 
Do not aspire to that. Streaking in the name of Jesus <laughs> is not a very positive church planting technique. But in this case, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear. One person doesn't usually overpower seven. And the name of Jesus was held in high honor. And many of those who believed came and openly confessed their evil deeds. And a number who'd practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, what do we know about the church at Ephesus at this point? Well, there's two years been invested of teaching by Paul and Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila and others. There have been healings and miracles. There have been some unplanned events take place, including streaking through the streets. There's been widespread repentance in the city, not universal, but widespread. Um, it said that they, were, they, burn, they had a public burning, a public bonfire, where they burned things that had been used in the practice of evil, and it was valued at 50,000 drachmas. Now, most of us don't barter with drachmas anymore, but a drachma is the about, a coin about the equivalent of a day's wage. So let's just say that a day's wage was $100. If that's the case, 50,000 drachmas would be $5 million. If your day's wage is more than $100, you can adjust appropriately. But the point is, the bonfire ref reflected a significant financial sacrifice. Most of us, it's tax season. Most of us think, like, well, you know, I could donate that stuff to Goodwill and still get a tax deduction. No need to destroy it. How many of you think it'd make an impact in a city when millions of dollars of something that was used to affect evil outcomes was destroyed in a public place? You think that would stir a city? I think it could. But look at the outcome. It's the last line in that passage. It says that in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. That's the outcome of what's been happening in Ephesus. Well, in what way? If this is the way that the word of the Lord spreads widely and grows in power, in what way? Well, we just touched on the points. There's been consistent teaching. That's hard work to do that every day. Priscilla and Aquila changed locations. They moved to a new city. They had to make new friends, make new arrangements, totally disrupt their life. Paul has done it on a daily basis now himself for two years. It's hard work. They have prayed for the sick and the suffering. How do we know that? Well, it says there were miracles and many were healed. Well, if they're not, you have to be praying for the sick and the suffering in order to have that happen. They've addressed the spiritual forces which harassed people. How do we know that? Well, there were these seven brothers of the Jewish chief priests. They had watched it happen enough and seen enough outcome. They just thought they would try it. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. We don't know him, but we know Paul. They'd watched enough to know somehow Jesus' name mattered. There were spiritual victories happening before there were physical changes in the city. There was this respect for God that grew. A respect for God. Hmm. And then people repent at a pretty significant personal expense. Five million dollars would be a low estimate. That seems to me that'd be a pretty significant expense in our community if five million dollars of, of something were destroyed publicly as an expression of repentance, wouldn't you say? I want to call your attention to one more word in that passage. If you'll look back with me in verse 18, it says, Many of those who believed came and openly confessed their evil deeds, and a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls and burned them publicly. That destruction, that bonfire was related to the practice of sorcery. I think we read that and we think, well, that's not a 21st century deal. We're not doing that anymore. But I would suggest, submit to you that sorcery is more widely practiced today in Middle Tennessee than it was in the first century in Ephesus. I don't think it's something far removed from us. The definition is helpful. Sorcery is the, the pursuit of spiritual influence or information through a source other than the Holy Spirit. The pursuit in acquiring spiritual influence, knowledge, power through a source other than the Holy Spirit. Now that's another one of the themes in the book of Acts. This isn't the only time we bump into this notion of the, the practice of sorcery. 
I didn't put it in your notes. There wasn't space. But you can take the references and check me later. In Acts chapter 8, it says in, there was a man named Simon who practiced sorcery in the city of Samaria. And it says that he amazed all the people of that city. That they, he boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, rich and poor, gave their attention and exclaimed, this man has divine power. Now, Paul, when he got there, he was confronted. But again, it's not limited to Acts 8. In Acts 13, it says they traveled to the island of Paphos, and there they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet who was the attendant to the, the Roman governor. This sorcerer had enormous political influence because he had the authority, the attention of the Roman governor. And he became a believer in Jesus. He was so impressed with the power he saw in the believers, he offered them money so that when he laid his hands on people, they would receive the Holy Spirit too. In Acts, further in the book of Acts, in Acts 16, in the city of Philippi, Paul and his team encounter a young woman who has a spirit of sorcery. She can tell the future. And those who control her make a great deal of money because people are anxious to know that. And in Ephesus, it's a big enough problem that millions of dollars have been invested in the practice. This isn't some subtext in this emerging story of Christianity. It's one of the essential threads of the fabric. Now, what do we learn from that? Well, if I had to put it in the simplest possible terms, you and I should avoid any involvement with the occult, period. Look at Acts 19. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way, and a silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. And he called them together, along with workmen in related trades. It's not just the people that are making idols. He pulls in everybody he can. And he says, we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul is convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. See, there's a battle about the belief system, about the worldview. Paul is presented as leading them astray. He's the deceiver. He's the manipulator. He's being argued against in the public square. Do you have the courage to stand up for Jesus? Wealthy, influential, powerful people may speak against you. You don't have to go find a fight. You're just praying for the sick and those that are suffering. You're just advocating for Jesus. You're just helping people who are bound by unclean spiritual forces be set free. And if you do that frequently enough and the impact is significant enough, somebody's going to say, I don't like that. He says that Paul says man-made gods are no gods at all. Yes, he did. Now watch what happens. Verse 28, when they heard this, they were furious and they began to shout, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Artemis is the god they worship. That's the city god. Soon the whole city was in an uproar and the people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions, and rushed as one man into the theater. They're going to kill him. Paul wanted to appear, but they held him back because if he'd stepped into that arena, they would have killed him. So on the heels of revival, there's a riot. And the fuel of the riot is really about uh, influence and economics. Now, why does that matter to you and me? Well, in this particular case, many people have embraced Jesus, enough so that the economy shifted. Now, you and I want to imagine if we had that kind of an igniting of the church and an awakening to spiritual things that everyone would celebrate. But everyone in Ephesus didn't celebrate, and I don't think everyone in Middle Tennessee would separate, celebrate. Because some people are profiting greatly from the promotion of evil. And through deception, they managed to ignite a riot. Now again, we've imagined that with widespread influence of the gospel, there'll be universal joy and enthusiasm. It's a nice imagination, it just isn't biblical. We've thought if God's spirit was poured out where you work or in your neighborhood or in the school where your kids go or in your family system, if there were some people that really began to turn their lives to the Lord, that everybody would go, hallelujah. It's a nice idea. Again, it just can't be derived from scripture. That's not the pattern we're given. But the outcome for you and me has been when there's been a little pushback or a little resistance, we've become timid. 
When there are complaints, we dial it back. Well, if someone objects, I should be quiet. Folks, that's not how the church began, and that's not how the church will thrive. We're watching all sorts of cultural changes be unleashed, and the people that are igniting those cultural changes are unrelenting and unapologetic. Why is it that we're so timid? I believe it's time for courageous faith from the people of God. You know, the enemies of the cross of Christ, it seems to me, have increasing boldness in asserting ideas and reapportioning resources and how we interact with the world. And in that same season, the Christians have been increasingly quiet, it seems to me, accommodating, almost passive. Well, I believe it's time for a bit more of a courageous faith, not to be obnoxious or arrogant or condemning or criticizing, simply in our spheres of influence, let's speak the truth that we know. Let's be unflinching advocates for Jesus. In the book of Acts, the early church prayed that God would give them boldness to speak his word with courage. And that's my prayer for the church in our generation, that you and I would have the courage to say, we believe Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God that his involvement in our lives is a good thing, that he will change your life. God has given you influence in the lives of some people. If you will use it, he will expand your influence. It's time for courageous faith. I wanna pray for you before we go. Father, I thank you that you sent your son to deliver us from the power of darkness, that our sins might be forgiven, to put our feet on a path that would enable us to lay up treasure in heaven. Give us boldness to own the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.